is weird, odd, strange, or just plain bizarre is really your cup of tea. Then the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast will give you that fix. Can't believe it? Well, listen for yourself as we deliver the strangest news you definitely won't find on CNN or Fox. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Weird News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope you all had a wonderful weekend, whether that was um, a weekend of fun or a weekend of relaxing or um, a productive weekend or a combination of all three of those. Whatever is a good weekend to you, I hope you were able to achieve that. My hubby celebrated his 50th birthday over the weekend, so that was fun, although we had a million people in our house. It was actually only 75, but for me, a giant introvert, 75 feels like a million. (laughs) All very nice people, don't get me wrong, but I'm like, whoo, so many people. Hubby was totally in his element, though. He is a massive extrovert and loves that kind of stuff. But we are not here to talk about whether or not um, my husband and I are introverts or extroverts. We are here to talk about weird news. And our first story is one that comes about because it is the 50th season of Sesame Street, which started on November 9th. Um, and this is a sort of a side note, but they had a, a, a 50th... The premiere of the 50th season started, uh, pre- pre- premiered, excuse me, the, on HBO. I can't speak, which I, I think is weird in itself. I mean, Sesame Street and HBO should not be in the same sentence. But okay. I mean, you know, it, Sesame Street meets Game of Thrones or something like that. What, whatever. But anyway, it, it premiered on HBO November 9th. So, well, first of all, the hubby and Sesame Street are the same age. So that's kind of cool. But, I love Sesame Street. I grew up with Sesame Street. I watched it after school. It, we did not have PBS when I was growing up, but the one of the local businesses in my hometown actually paid to have it on regular television so that people could watch it. Maybe it wasn't the hometown. Maybe it was the whatever, wherever the, wherever the station was, probably it was in the bigger town, 75 or so miles away. It doesn't really matter. Somebody enabled me to watch Sesame Street, and for that, I am grateful. Anyway, I keep seeing Sesame Street 50th uh, anniversary news on my social media feeds. And one thing that pops up often is the is a picture of the original cast, which makes sense because it is an anniversary. So they show that first season and the original cast. And Oscar the Grouch in those first pictures is orange, orange. Now, if you know Oscar the Grouch, if you are a fan of Sesame Street, or even if you're not a fan of Sesame Street, you probably know that Oscar the Grouch is green. And it turns out that he was orange in the first season in 1969, and then starting in 1970, he became green. Even more interesting, I think, is that in um, the initial drawings for Oscar the Grouch, Jim Henson envisioned him as purple. So Oscar the Grouch went from purple, not in real life, but, you know, imagined as purple, to orange for a season, and then green. And this was explained that he, uh, when he when he came back the second season, he was green. It was explained that he, um, he changed to green because he spent so much time in, um, uh, on a visit to the, to Swamp Mushy Muddy. <laughs> and he spent so much time there that he became covered in slime and algae and it just apparently stuck. And that's why he's green, which honestly makes sense for Oscar. Oscar is a Muppet who lives in a trash can. If you are not familiar, he has an endless supply of trash. He is grouchy, as his name implies. But also I learned in doing a little looking into this orange to green mystery that uh, grouch describes his overall attitude, but it also refers to his species. Yes, grouch is his species. And there are other grouches. If you have, um, if you've watched throughout the years, then other other members of the grouch family, or maybe the grouch species, if they're not related, show up at Oscar's trash can and 
are equally as grouchy usually as Oscar is. So Oscar has these uh, this collection of seemingly useless junk, but sometimes it actually comes in handy. And he, what I like about Oscar is that he's grouchy, he's unhelpful, he doesn't like anybody, and yet all of the people and you know all the all the people, all the Muppets, all the children on Sesame Street. Uh, people, children are people, all the adults, all the Muppets, all the children on Sesame Street still love him and accept him and go visit him and, and help him with his problems. And, you know, he's, he's the kind of like Eeyore in that way. He's a little bit of a misfit, but he is still beloved by the people who surround him. So, um, he is played, he has been played by Carol Spinney, uh, from the first season. He, uh, uh Carol Spinney also does the voice of Big Bird. Um, although now Oscar the Grouch has been voiced by Eric Jacobson f- since 2015, although Carol Spinney does some occasionally still do, um, do that voice. Interestingly enough, uh, Oscar apparently has an alias. Um, one of his other names is Oski, which is Grun- Grungetta's pet name for him. Aww. And, um, yeah, I forgot that there was a girlfriend that he, that Grungetta was his girlfriend. Oh, how could I forget that? That's terrible. Um, so it, it turns out that, um, initially the puppet characters on Sesame Street did not actually appear on Sesame Street itself, but were relegated to the intermediary segments. Uh, then creator Jim Henson wanted them to be more of an integral part of the series. Thank goodness. Suggesting, um, a giant bird and creature living in, uh, <laughs> suggesting a giant bird and a creature living in the neighborhood's trash can. <laughs> so the character of Oscar the Grouch was developed by Sesame Street head writer John Stone and Henson and was based on the personality of a magnificently rude restaurant owner. <laughs> Ooh, I wonder who that was. Um, as I said, puppeteer Carol Spinney found inspiration for the voice in the driver of a New York City taxi that he took to the studio. Jim Henson credits the character's name to the owner and namesake of Oscar's Salt of the Sea. According to Jim Henson's biography, Henson and John Stone frequented Oscar's Salt of the Sea. Henson's office was on East 67th Street, just around the corner from Oscar's Salt of the Sea on 3rd Avenue. In the early 1960s, Henson and Stone often had lunch there and observed that the owner, Oscar Carp, dressed in black, looked unkempt, and had a gruff disposition. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Oscar remained orange for the first season of Sesame Street and then changed to green, which became his permanent color. Um, I'm, I'm having less difficulty picturing him as orange than purple. Oscar the Grouch should not be purple. <laughs> um, according to Sesame Street's Robert W. Morrow, Oscar was created to indirectly demonstrate racial and ethnic diversity. Since his manners and tastes were different from those of the other characters, his creators hoped to address social issues by using his differences as a metaphor for racial and ethnic differences. Some viewers, however, saw Oscar as a surrogate for poor urban Americans during the early seasons. So I learned a ton about Oscar the Grouch because he, you know, showed up in a bunch of pictures on my news feed being orange. <laughs> and... I, I am very excited. Um, I was always fascinated with Oscar's trash can as a kid. It, it was on par with Snoopy's doghouse. Like you rarely saw inside the trash can, but every once in a while you'd get a glimpse. You'd get a glimpse of Snoopy's doghouse and you'd get a glimpse of Oscar's trash can. And I, um, I don't want to say I lived for those moments, but I, every time I, every time Oscar was on, I wanted to know what was going on in his trash can. So it's kind of like the TARDIS. It appears to be the, a normal sized trash can on the outside, but it's actually bigger on the inside. And, um, it was notably revealed in the film, The Adventures of Elmo in Grouchland. Um, and Oscar has noted through the years that it boasts such amenities as a farm, swimming pool, ice rink, bowling alley, and a piano. Oscar could occasionally be seen rotating um, while descending into his trash can, implying a spiral staircase. Other items include Slimy, Oscar's pet worm, who has a baby sister named Sloppy, Fluffy, Oscar's pet elephant. That's right. You always hear Floppy trumpeting and running around in the trash can. Uh, Oscar's shoes and a dimension gate to Grouchland, USA. That's a little more, that's a little further beyond my, my watching time, but 
um, Grouchland USA is, of course, Oscar's hometown, because where else would he be from? It also contains, most likely, many boatloads of trash. Well, yeah, of course. Um, as stated on multiple occasions, the trash can also has a back door. Love it. We're going to go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. And when we are go- when we come back, we're going to be talking about the accidental origins of Play-Doh. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Weird News Podcast. And I'll be right back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Weird News Podcast. So before the break, of course, we were talking about the origin stories of Oscar the Grouch, I guess. Uh, the fact that he started out as orange, originally thought of as purple, and then has been green for the last 49 years. And our second segment is another origin story of sorts, and um, it is... One of those, one of those stories, origin stories that, that begins as an accident and then turns into something that we are all very familiar with. Uh, well, probably very familiar with, and that is Play-Doh. I'm gonna guess that most of us have played with Play-Doh at some time, at some point in our lives. Have you ever wondered where it came from or why it came about? Uh, this uh, comes from an article on smithsonian.com that popped up somewhere recently for me and I was like, oh, uh, the origins of Plato. It was an accident. Um, so founded in 1912, um, a Cincinnati company called Kutol, uh, had a, um, a primary product that was a soft pliable compound used for wiping soot from wallpaper. And, uh, it was no longer in demand and the firm's future then looked bleak. Fortunately, the sister-in-law of one, it's one of its principals had an idea, let kids play with it which in itself is interesting. I mean, you have a soft, pliable compound used for wiping soot from wallpaper. (laughs) Now, clearly, 1912 is different than 2012, because in 2012, probably that would not have been the first thought. And if somebody had said, let the kids play with it, uh, people would have freaked out. Oh my gosh, is it toxic? What do they eat it? What's going on? You know, we can't let them play with wallpaper, soot wiping, whatever it was. (laughs) But no. And... Uh, you know, we don't have a lot of soot on our wallpaper now anyway because of the differences in heating. But this was the idea. Let kids play with it. And uh, so a little background. Kutol products had become the largest wallpaper cleaner manufacturer in the world in the early 20th century. But um, fortunes began to change in the 1950s. Oh, so it was. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. It was founded in 1912. It was not recommended. But still, even in the 50s. Um they wouldn't have been concerned about children playing with, uh, you know, they were chewing on lead paint. <laughs> they didn't know it was bad. Anyway, so fortunes began to change for the company in the 1950s with the transi- transition from heating with dirtier coal to cleaner oil, gas, and electricity. That sooty buildup on the wallpaper was no longer an issue in many households. Joseph McVicker was trying to turn around the struggling company when his sister-in-law read an article about how wallpaper cleaner cleaner could be used for modeling projects. So see, it wasn't even actually her idea. Sister-in-law Kay Zufall, a nursery school teacher, tested the non-toxic material with children. How did they know it was non-toxic? I don't know. Anyway, uh, she tested it with children who loved molding it into all kinds of shapes. She told McVicker of her discovery and even suggested a new name. Play-Doh. So brilliant. Um, good job, sister-in-law Kay. And she even got to name it, which is cool. Um, it's a tale of technological obsolescence with a happy ending, says Christopher Bench, vice president of collections at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. 
Fortunately, the sister-in-law realized it would make a better toy than the cleaning product. That turned the company's fortunes around. That's, I, I just think that's fascinating. I mean, they went from producing a cleaning product to now manufacturing what it would be marketed as a toy. Um, that's different advertising of, and stuff. Um, so now, of course, most of us know what Play-Doh is. You, it comes with all kinds of different accessories and accoutrement for playing with it and making it into different things. It's now owned by Hasbro, and this accidental invention has grown into a worldwide franchise that is, you know, probably as much a part of kids' lives as, as anything else. I mean, that's kind of an iconic childhood um, thing, right? And even if you don't have actual Play-Doh, maybe you have the homemade Play-Doh, which is slightly different, but it's still fun to play with and you can eat it. <laughs> it's very salty, but you can eat it. According to Fortune Magazine, Play-Doh has sold more than 3 billion cans since its debut as a child's toy in 1956, eclipsing its previous existence as a wallpaper cleaner by light years. That's more than 700 million pounds of Play-Doh. Urban legend has it that if you look at all of the Play-Doh compound created since 1956 and put it through the Play-Doh Fun Factory playset, you could make a snake that would wrap around the world 300 times, writes Hasbro on the Play-Doh site. The dough was inducted into the National Toy Hall of Fame at the, at strong, at the strong in 1998. In addition to the soft, pliable compound that we, uh, I'm sure, all know and love, the product line has grown to include Play-Doh Touch, Play-Doh Kitchen Creations, Play-Doh Shape and Learn, Do Vinci, an arts and crafts toy system for making artistic creations, and many more. See, when I was a kid, no Do Vinci, just, you know, um, Play-Doh, and I didn't really have the, the, the stuff that went with it. We just got Play-Doh. And then, you know... It, you'd scoop it out of the can and it'd get all under your fingernails and that was always kind of gross. And Play-Doh, have you ever noticed it has that kind of strange smell? It wasn't my favorite smell as a kid. Some people really like it, but it wasn't my favorite smell as a kid. And then it gets stuck on your fingernails and then you smell it for the rest of the day. But um, I'm not saying I didn't like Play-Doh. Don't, don't, don't take that from what I just said. <laughs> but um, there are also... Um, Co-branding extensions that feature My Little Pony, Disney Princesses, Star Wars, and Disney Frozen characters and play sets. And now there are new compounds that have just hit the market. Play-Doh Putty, Foam, Slime, Cloud, and Crackle. I have not played with any of those. Now I must find a child who has them and get invited for a play date. Who, who has Play-Doh Crackle and wants to invite me over? Anyone? Okay, let me know. Um, so a quote, looking at key consumer insights over the past couple of years, we have seen a growing desire for new ways for children to express their creativity and cultural trends, like the viral sensation slime has become amongst today's kids and tweens, um, it helped inspire the launch for this year. And this is from Adam Kleinman, Hasbro's vice president of global brand marketing. And he told that he, he said that quote is, was told to the Huff Post in September. Original Originally available in white only in 1956, boring, um, Play-Doh soon expanded to include basic colors, red, blue, and yellow. It's now sold in a multitude of hues, of course. Uh, as a kid, I always wanted the neon ones, um, but usually we just got the primary colors. But uh, so some of those those hues include rose red, purple paradise, garden green, and blue lagoon. I want to be the person that names things like crayons and Play-Doh and paint. How do I get that job? I need to look into that. Things just have such fascinating, interesting names. Um, the putty line includes metallic and glittery tints. The recipe has gone through minor modifications over time. At one point, the amount of salt was reduced so that the product would not dry out so quickly. But for the most part, the mixture has remained the same. And I know it is non-toxic, um, but still, it's got that smell, and I don't think you should eat it. <laughs> 
According to Bench, Zufall is the mother of this time-tested toy. That is Kay, the sister-in-law. For her students in nursery school, she was looking for a suitable alternative to modeling clay, which could be messy and difficult to work with for young hands. Zufall had read an article about using wallpaper cleaner to make holiday decorations and thought that might just do the trick. She had a hard time locating a container made by Kutal Products since manufacturing had already been scaled back. Well, fortunately, as the sister-in-law, she probably had an in. Um, the wallpaper cleaner was already being phased out, Bench says. Kutal was headed down the drain at that point. Um, Zufal then took her discovery to McVicker, who formed the subsidiary Rainbow Crafts Company. He began marketing his old product by its new name, which was suggested by Zufal and her husband, whose name was Robert, and then Woodra- Wood- Woodward and Lothrop of Department Store in Washington, D.C. was the first to carry Play-Doh. Macy's and Marshall Fields soon took an interest in the toy and began selling it, too. Sales soared in 1958 when Play-Doh was featured in televised ads on Captain Kangaroo, Ding Dong School, and Romper Room. Um, Bob Keeshan, who portrayed Captain Kangaroo, would talk about the product, um, twice a week on his show, which definitely increased the sales. That is, uh, if you don't know who Captain Kangaroo is, then you are certainly uh, not of a certain age. There was never a contract, but the deal ran for years. Oh, he, and he, I'm sorry, he earned 2% of the sales. And so there was never a contract, but the deal ran for years, according to Bench. Captain Kangaroo was a big cheerleader for the product. The product line branched out in 1960 with the introduction of the Play-Doh Fun Factory, a toy press that allowed the compound to be pumped out in different shapes. Other line extensions included Animal Arc, Make a Meal, Sub Shop, and Dr. Drill and Fill, though none had the lasting ability of the Fun Factory, which is still sold today. So what's your favorite memory of Play-Doh? What is the best thing you ever made with Play-Doh? I am not sure. You know, the thing with Play-Doh, were you the kind of kid who insisted that you keep the colors separate, or were you okay with mixing them together? I always wanted them separate because once you mix them together, you cannot unmix them. And then you have this sort of mushy, smir- swirly, it, it could be really cool, but no, I was that kid that was like, don't mix the Play-Doh! <sighs> anyway, which type of kid were you? On that note, as you ponder your Play-Doh choices in life, we're going to go ahead and take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, more weird news. Stay tuned. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC Weird News Podcast. We were talking about Play-Doh before the break and the accidental invention of it. And I know I said we were moving on from Play-Doh, but I just have to share one more thing that I did not share before the break. I was talking about the smell, that smell that Play-Doh has, right? It's very distinct. And, you know, you open it and it, it's it's just very distinct. And I don't know what it is because um, it's a mixture... The, it's a non-toxic mixture. Play-Doh is a non-toxic mixture of flour, water, salt, borax, and mineral oil. Maybe it's the borax combined with the mineral oil. I really don't know, but Play-Doh has a very distinct smell. And it turns out that to mark the product's 50th anniversary as a toy in 20, in 2006, Hasbro created a Play-Doh perfume. It worked with Demeter fragrance to create a fresh out of the can aroma. It was a great gag gift, uh, Bench says, but I don't think it did anything more than that. I would hope, no, I would hope not. Who, seriously in their right mind, wants to smell like Play-Doh? Unless, I mean, if you're a preschool teacher, you might smell like it, but you don't want to. Um, so, it, to preserve its propi- proprietary pungency, Hasbro filed for a trade for trademark protection in 2017, claiming the product had a unique scent formed through the combination of a sweet, slightly musky, vanilla-like fragrance with slight overtones of cherry, and the not natural smell of a salted wheat-based dough. Does that sound like Play-Doh? No, not to me. The company received the trademark um, on May 18th, 2018. So. 
they have even trademarked that scent. And I just find that fascinating that not only did they trademark it and they call it vanilla with overtones of cherry, makes no sense, but that they made a perfume. Gag gift, yes. Actual gift, not so much. Okay, so let's move away from Play-Doh now. I promise this time we really will. Um, speaking of sort of childhood nostalgia, uh, if you are old enough, how many of you watched Gilligan's Island as a kid? I know I did. It was on in syndication, and so I watched it after school. And um, it, so here is a, uh, a, a Gilligan's Isle, Gilligan's Island um, inspired story. It's not inspired, but here's let me just give you the headline. Cows swept off coast during Hurricane Dorian survive Gilligan's Island style. I really hope that there was one who was a pro- like the professor and was able to make things out of coconuts. That would make me very happy. But you know, there, it turns out that there are only three cows, not the um, how many one, two, seven that were on Gilligan's Island. So three cows who were swept off the coast during Hurricane Dorian managed to miraculously survive in a manner perfect for a bovine-centered reboot of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> would you watch a bovine-centered reboot of Gilligan's Island? That sounds like something that it's got to be a cartoon. It would have to be, obviously, um, live action would be too weird. The cows in question were part of a wild herd of 20 cows that roamed private land on Cedar Island, North Carolina, according to the Charlotte Observer. Um, and they were then swept off during Hurricane Dorian, which has got to be extremely scary. But they... Um, the, so when Dorian hit the area on September 6th, a lot of the wildlife was swept off the island, was swept off of the island, including 28 wild horses. So this is a very sad story in some aspects. Uh, the trio of cows were presumed dead, understandably, until recently. And this article is about five days old. Uh, until recently, when they were all discovered living in the Cape Lookout National Seashore Park on the outer banks. Again, I want there to be a coconut car or a coconut, you know, battery or something. Um, Park spokesman B.G. Horvat told the New York Times, it's a tremendous story of how they made it. If the cows could talk, imagine the story they can tell you of enduring that rush of water. See, that's why it needs to be a cartoon, right? He added, that must be incredible. It seems the castaway cows managed to swim five miles to a barrier island where they then survived by grazing off the land, according to the BBC. Park staff noticed the first cow about a month after the storm. The others revealed themselves within the last two weeks. Now the National Park Service is determining the best way to return the cows to their home with the front runner being to sedate them and then take them back to Cedar Island on a boat, according to the Washington Post. Now, if this really were a cartoon of a Gilligan's Island with cows, they would make the plan, and then something, of course, would happen so that the folks who came to sedate the cows and take them home on the boat would get off the island, but the cows would not, because that was pretty much the premise of every Gilligan's <laughs> Island episode where someone came to the island. That person would get off the island, but the uh, the castaways would not. So um, did you watch Gilligan's Island as a kid? Were you a fan? Who was your favorite character? Did you like Ginger or did you like Marianne? Poor Mrs. Mrs. Howell never gets included in that conversation, <laughs> but um, I have lots of great memories. It was the Flintstones and Gilligan's Island, and that is what I would watch after school. Um, for a while, it was Hogan's Heroes. It kind of changed depending, I mean, throughout the years, that syndicated lineup after school changed, but that is a big part of my childhood. So, you know how I always talk about, you know, people should write a children's book. Well, this episode, I'm saying someone should make a... Um, cartoon cow gilly uh cow cowligans island maybe too much <laughs> um, and it could be the story of how these cows survived i'm happy that they survived i mean seriously i don't know how many of the other animals including those 28 horses were if any of them survived but these three cows you know first they swam five miles and then they survived just you know being cows and eating what they grazing on what they could find and now they're going to be sedated and taken back home and maybe they want to go maybe they don't want to go really don't know the answer to that but um 
cows, Gilligan's Island. Good stuff. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining me for the weird new GSMC weird news podcast. I love finding out these very strange, random, sometimes fascinating facts. And I hope you do too. Join me again next time. If you do like learning about these ra- strange, random, sometimes fascinating facts, we would love it if you would subscribe follow us on social media, do all those wonderful things that help us on the internet, especially giving us a five-star rating. That would be incredibly helpful to get the random, weird, sometimes fascinating facts out to more people. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time. In the meantime, you know, stay weird. Thanks.